Hello everybody, welcome back to Find My Past From Home, the free family history series designed with you in mind. My name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. I'm delighted to be back here today chatting to you all. And before we get started, I'll, I'll wait for a, a couple of you to, to settle in with your tea and biscuits, hopefully, or beverage and snack of choice, of course. Uh, you will actually notice I am somewhere slightly different today. I'm actually in our London office, which is really lovely, and it means I get to see some of my colleagues there. Uh, upstairs I'm downstairs in the basement area so I don't bother anybody while I'm seemingly chatting to myself um, to the computer but I'm actually not alone today which is really 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 nice um, I'm really really pleased to welcome back a returning guest exciting um, and I will allow her to introduce herself so please welcome back house historian Melanie back Hanson welcome back hello <laughs> how are you today Mel I'm good. I'm good. Um, it's great to be back. This is really nice. I, I like this kind of chatting away. And actually, this is my first online talk of 2022. So, you know, ta -da! <laughs> <laughs> please do say hello in the comments, everybody. Tell us where you're tuning in from today, what the weather's like, how you're feeling. And just chat, chat amongst chat amongst yourselves. Um, none of us bite, of course. Uh, we're all very, very, very friendly here. But uh, just in case any of our lovely community are not familiar with you, Melanie, um, would you mind just briefly introducing yourself, please? Yes. Uh, well, hello. Um, I am a house historian, um, which a lot of people are sorting, are sort of getting to know a bit better, I think, in recent years. I think it's becoming a bit more obvious as to what that is. But for those who don't know, um, essentially, I specialise in the social history of houses. So it's very much telling the historical stories through the life of our houses. So all the way back to when they were built, why they were built, but all the stories of, of families moving in and out and the different stories and the different people who've been connected to a house through the years. Um, and alongside, I do that in a freelance basis. So most of my clients are private homeowners or corporate clients. Um, but alongside that, I write books. Um, so my most recent was A House Through Time with David Oldesuga. Um, I was also a research consultant for the TV series. Um, and I have done some other bits and pieces like that. I did a program with Phil Spencer on the history of houses. Um, I also give talks like this um, and write articles. And so everything house history related um and I'll, I'll be there <laughs> <laughs> and we're so glad you are as well you know you're such a familiar face in the house history world right now and I for one I'm so happy that more and more people are falling into the into house yeah. history because it's it's so rewarding and there was a little phrase that um was used last week when I chatted to some of the other histo uh, historians from house history out and it was um the micro it's a micro history of yes. house history which I just love and yeah you never know what you're going to find and then suddenly you have a connection to these people who you've never met you don't even have a yeah. connection to them but yeah. you have a connection to them in the sense that you walk along the same floorboards and you experience the same life events, the same trial. Well, maybe not exactly the same trials and tribulations, yeah. but it's just life, I suppose. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And you really connect with that. I think that, you know, you live in the, phys the same physical space that, that they may have done or, or your perhaps your ancestors did or. Um, but yeah, you, uh, it is that personal history and actually there's, there's something really special in it. It's, it's fascinating and it just doesn't, doesn't matter what kind of house you have. And I think that's another thing. I, I've always said this, you know, I think for a long time, people thought you had to live in a big stately home and, and to have any stories, but actually you could live in a tiny cottage in Cornwall or a two up, two down in Birmingham, wherever you are, you know, there's always something you can find. There's always really interesting stories. And even if you live in a property that's a little bit newer, for example, and mm. you know maybe only built in the last, say, ten or twenty years, or even 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 if it's a brand new build, um, there's always going to be houses that you have a connection to, whether it's the house your grandparents lived in yeah. or the house your best friend from school lived in. There's always yeah. going to be some sort of property that's seventy or eighty years old at least. And yeah. Yeah, you can just find so much cool stuff. <laughs> Let's welcome a few of our lovely community today. So we've got my best friend, Audrey, from a grey but ah. not actually rainy Cheshire. Hello. Uh, we've got Shana joining us from the West Midlands, a Victorian house built in 1901 when the street hadn't got a name yet, land bought by a from a pub landlord by an insurance agent. Ah, 
Nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we've got John joining us from a very cold minus 11 degrees Toronto. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely a great day to do genealogy and, and yeah. house history, but every day is a great day for that. <laughs> yes. And over on YouTube, we've got Graham joining us from Wakefield in West Yorkshire. We've got Janet joining us from Wimborne. <laughs> Andrea from a cold stoke on Trent. Yes, lots of uh, the weather is getting chillier. Mm. Absolutely. And lovely to see so many of our regular uh, faces here in the comments today. And also I've, I've been spotting a couple of new names as well. Um, so this is fantastic. Our community is growing all the time. I just love how much you all help each other out. It's warms my heart. Um, okay, let's get cracking. So before, in terms of what we're going to do today, we are going to talk about the stories behind houses and how you can tell those stories. And what Mel and I have been looking at in particular is just a couple, like a handful of the resources that you can use to tell these stories. So we've been looking at the 1911 census, the newly released 1921 census, and then the 1939 register. But these are just, these are just starting points, everybody. There's loads more to look at. But What's quite cool is that we've had the 1911 census, we've had the 1939 register, and now we've got that extra little bit which sort of fills the gap in between, which is great. So that is what we're going to be looking at today. And Melanie has very, very kindly uh, prepared some, some examples to show us as well, which is really, really yes. cool. Um, but before we get on to those, um, as I've already mentioned, last week I spoke to some of your colleagues from House History Hour, which was fantastic. And if you've not gone and watched that yet, everybody, <laughs> you can find it on Facebook and on YouTube. Well worth the watch. But what I did for them is I asked them to tell me which house they looked at first in the 1921 census when it was released and why that house. And I wondered if I could put that question to you as well. Yes, well, and I did, did catch the chat last week. And so I was intrigued about what all my House History Hour colleagues were saying um, and talking about. Uh, but interestingly, I didn't grow up in England. I grew up in Australia. So different kind of context. Um, and I know a lot of my colleagues kind of went back to sort of family homes or homes like that. But I actually have to be really honest, the first houses I looked at were my current private commissions because <laughs> I'm in the middle of, of researching them. So, of course, why not go straight to, to what I'm working on at the minute? So one of which is actually a Tudor house in Staffordshire. So it's quite old and, you know, it had been around for quite some time by, by the 1921 census. Um, and interestingly, it's uh, – I. I should preface this with actually most of the houses I've been looking at, I struggled to find them on initial searching. Um, and I think that's largely because so many of the houses I look at, they don't have straightforward street addresses. Yeah. Even now they don't. So, <laughs> you know, 80, 200 years ago, they're, they're not quite so easy to find in, in searches. Um, but as it happened, I knew pretty much who was there in 1921, um, although his name was mistranscribed, I should. <laughs> but I did find the family who were a farming family, as it's literally rural Staffordshire. Um, and the house, as I say, it was built in the 16th century. But by the time it was the 19, 1920s, it had become quite run down and was an old farmhouse effectively, which happened to a lot of our old houses. Um, but I did find them and I found the whole family. Um, and so that was really great. And it just sort of backed up all the other evidence that I had. Um, and then the other house I looked at was actually a lovely house in Salisbury, which I'm also researching. Um, and it was built in the early 18th century. So again, it's been around for a while. Um, but one I found really curious about this one is I did find it on the address search because it has a much sort of clearer address, um, which is great. Um, and the family had actually been there for generations. So I pretty much knew who should be there. But interestingly, um, and I think one of my colleagues said this last week, that there was a different household also attached to the house, but was was on a different uh, household sheet uh, on a different um, plan. And I didn't know about them. So as it happened, they were it was the Peppers and they were living w basically in auxiliary buildings on the same site uh, as market gardeners. That's what they described at, which I thought was quite interesting. And I'm, it's a bit curious. I'm trying to work out if they were actually market gardening on the site of the house because there's a quite big huge garden at the rear of the house um or they actually lived there 
a market garden somewhere else, which is probably more likely. But yeah, it was a bit of it. So that was quite a surprise. I was quite pleased to find that because there was a whole extra family effectively living there. Um, but uh, yeah, so they were the two I looked at first. And so some some things that backed up what I already knew, but some new information, which was really helpful. So yeah, really good. Always good. And, yeah. you know, we've we've talked about... Um... We talk, we've, I've already mentioned the phrase that the, you know, the house history is sort of a micro history. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're going to be talking a little bit today about how we can use just a, a very small handful of resources to sort of get started on that story of finding, mm -hmm. you know, who lived in your house, what were they up to, what did they experience. Mm -hmm. But what is, it, what is it for you about resources like census records and the 1939 register? Why is it for you? Why are, why are they so key for what you do? Well, yeah, they, they're vital, actually. And I think one of the key points is it provides personal information about the whole household. And I think this is really, especially for 20th century records, I think a lot of the time you think, oh, well, it's more recent history, so it should be quite easy to, to work out or to find details. But because of data protection, actually, the 20th century can be more difficult to find personal information. Um, so something like the 1921 census, it's it's imperative to build the story about everyone in the house. And I think because a lot of other re resources and sources, things like trade directories or electoral registers, they're not they're not going to list every single person in the house. You know, the, for the electoral register, you're not going to find children. You're not going to find people who were not eligible. And actually, say, for example, in 1921, uh, yes, some women had gained the vote if you were over 30 and it was still um, based on property ownership or property um, values. So in a lot of cases, a lot of women are still not eligible to vote. So things like that, which you're not going to get women and children. Um, the trade directory, you might only get the head of the house, but you you lose so much more of the story about what's actually going on in the house because you don't know how many servants are there how many other family members, um, perhaps it is divided in some way and only, you've only got one person listed in the directory. So there's so much more of that sort of personal history and the census has all of that. And even though it's only every 10 years, it's a vital piece of information because it adds all that, not only who they were, but now we've got the 1921 census, you've got things like where they worked, um, as well as how old they were or um, their, where they were born and all that sort of information, which totally brings people to life. So you can understand uh, there was one house, actually the Salisbury house. I realized in 1921, the, there's a widow who's the head of the house, but she has a, a servant and the servant is over 60. And I was thinking, goodness me, imagine being over 60 and still being working as a servant in a large house. But interestingly, in the 1939 register, they're still there. And they're now over, the, the servant was like 81 and the head, the, the head of the house, the lady, the widowed lady, she was like 79 or something. So you gain this whole picture about what's going on, 20s, 30s, there's these two older women, one's the, the lady of the house, one's a servant, but it just brings that story to life. And you can picture these two older women living in this big house. It's probably getting a bit run down. Um, you know, it's it's you're leading up to the Second World War. There's a whole lot more that you can find out from that story alone. So it's all that sort of stuff, which I just it's just vital for telling the stories. Yeah. It's just those little little, little clues, those little puzzle pieces. Yeah. Yeah, it's just fantastic. And I wonder if she was maybe not just her servant, but maybe also her companion. Yeah, I wondered that, especially by the 1939, because other than that, there was only one other male servant who was was recorded as sort of um, help. Um, so clearly doing all the hard work in the house. Yeah. But meanwhile, there were these two older ladies who, yeah, I, I imagine they you know they they lived and worked together for at least 20 years that I know of so far. Um, so I imagine they must have been. You kind that you kind of think they had to be more than than just servant and master, and they they must have been companions. So yeah, I like to think so. Um, we've already <laughs> mentioned electoral rolls uh, and electoral yeah. registers, but if anybody watching is curious about how to take their house history beyond the census records, for example, the nineteen thirty nine register, where else would you advise them looking? What other resources are available? Yeah, it's. Um, I would probably. If you, I mean, the thing is, 
if you're balancing between in the archive research and online research, that's a, another tricky thing um, because it can be more difficult. Uh, straight away, trade directories and electoral registers are the next best thing for that period. But in a lot of cases, it's not so easy to search because you don't, if you don't know the names of people, um, then it's a bit trickier. So, but they're definitely the best places to go um, to fill in those pieces. Um, but you might find things like newspapers as well. That's another key source, and that is available online through Find My Past and and the British Newspaper Archive. Um, and so you can search things like the actual address. You can search, and it's that can be really helpful, the search function for newspapers, because you can put in a variety of different search terms and words. And so you, you could find perhaps details of the neighbor and then that will lead you to details of your house. And it, so there's ways around kind of filling in the gaps. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a few things like definitely getting the names from those key sources um, and that will help. And you can start to fill in the gaps and see where changes occur as well. So, um, I think, as I said earlier, a lot of the houses I'm looking at, um, they had house names, not numbers. And to top it all off, they kept changing the name. <laughs> like there's there's one in particular in Kent, which is actually driving me bonkers because actually not only did the house itself I'm researching, it changed its name, but a lot of the neighboring houses also changed their names. So I'm trying to track, you know, like, okay, Mrs. Brown was there, but then the name of the house is different. And then, <laughs> So, so yeah, you become a bit of a detective piecing it together. But um, yeah, um, certainly it it is like a puzzle because you've got to use lots of different sources and piece elements together. Absolutely. And before we move on, I'm just going to read out a couple of these brilliant comments coming in from our community. Uh, Sally says, I put my house number and street into the newspaper records. That was really helpful. Yes, it's great fun, really yeah. fun to do. <laughs> um, I did it with my Edinburgh flat and yeah, there was a, a whirlwind of stuff that came back for that. <laughs> um, Rachel says, I've researched my house, which is an old worker's cottage in a village. As the village is so small, this helped in identifying my house in the different census records. I've not yet managed to go back further than 1841 census yet, but I had lots of interesting family stories happen in it. Yes, Ooh, nice. fantastic. Um, <laughs> What else have we got here? Oh, Jenny's here. Hello, Jenny in Norfolk. Uh, Linda's saying she lives in Salisbury. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, Becky says, I've just moved into a house which is of 200 years old. I think it's part of an old mill complex because of the archaeology and the stream that runs next door. But it's called The Lodge. I'd love to know where I can start tracing the inhabitants when all the census records give just the street name. Oh, I wonder if there are any clues lying around anywhere that might be able to help you with this. Mm. Well, uh, well, to answer. Um, OK, I would. Oh. Sorry, excuse it's at me. the door. Do you need to go right in the middle it. of the talk? I just knew it. Um, I'll ignore that. Um, you can go. So my apologies. Forgive me. It'll probably go again because they'll want to try and get someone to the door. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Okay. I would probably start with more recent uh, history just to sort of confirm names of people and track it back. Um, but I think the trouble is because house na names change, it sounds like that's potentially what's happened in this circumstance. Perhaps it had a different, it's got a different number and different name and it's changed. Um, but yeah, if you track it back from more recent history, but one other key source might be tax records, in particular, the 1910 valuation. Um, and I, this is another key source for that, the 20th century. And I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, but the, the key with this is, uh, is that it starts with a map and each property is identified on a map. So it's an, it's enormously useful because you can clearly look at a map and say, okay, that's my house on a map. And then it's allocated a number. And then the number corresponds with a, a field book um, or basically a, a um, survey valuation. And so you go to the field book and it will give you details about uh, the house. So the owner, the occupant, um, the name, if it's different, um, but also things like if it's freehold or if it's leasehold. Um, it also gives you potentially when the last lease was signed or when the last sale took place. Um, and then another key thing is it gives you a description. So um, it and that can be everything from, you know, ground floor 
it's got this room and that room and then there's a kitchen or it might give you things like at the WCs out the back, um, things like a real, it gives you a real picture about what the house was like in that sort of pre-First World War period. Um, and But the key thing is actually it identifies it on the map. Um, but if you've got things like the owner as well, then you can track not only who lived in the house, but who owned it. And that might give you clues uh, to perhaps manorial records or estate records if it was part of an estate. Um, but even if it, you could look for deeds and other records like that, which will help piece together when it was sold or what was going on in that side of things as well. So, yeah. The house sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds lovely. Yeah, if you do have any questions for Melanie, please do add them into the comments. We will try and get to as many as we can. Um, but what, what, what we're going to do now is we are going to move on to our main discussion. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Melanie, for this. And Melanie is kindly going to talk us through some examples, uh, like some real, real, real working examples of using things like the 1911 census, 1921 census, and the 1939 register to actually tell stories, the human stories behind a house. Um, and if we do have time, I have a wee example as well. But I will, I will absolutely uh, let Melanie uh, go ahead right now. Okay, great. Um, well, the first example I wanted to talk about was a house in Tunbridge Wells. Um, and again, this is a nice fun one where the name and the number keep changing. It had something like four <laughs> different names and it's got like, yeah, it's kind of a get, it just seems to be the houses I researched. They've all got lots of, they keep changing their names. Um, but um, it was really interesting. It's a, it was actually first built um, in the late 17th century. So right at the point where Tunbridge Wells is actually becoming um, a really popular destination for the spa and, and the, all the sort of society that went alongside that. Um, and it became actually a lodging house where people would come and take the waters in, in Tunbridge Wells. Um, so it had a really interesting history. Um, it, it was supposed to be somehow connected to Bo Nash, although I found absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. <laughs> sadly, sadly, I'm, I had to break it to the owner. Um, but by this point in the sort of turn of the 20th century, um, it's it had um, a, 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 another sort of widowed woman who was head of the house who was living there. Um, and she died shortly before the First World War. Um, so I have her in the 1911 census. Um, so her name was Catherine Weeks. Um, and at, at that time she was 73. Um, she was living in the house with her son and daughter and then two servants. Um, and it just puts, she was of independent means. So she's a, a wealthy lady of independent means living in this fairly large house in a nice part of Tunbridge Wells. Um, but as I say, just a few years later, she died um, in 19, uh, where have I got this? 14, December 1914. Um, and by this point, the house had become known as Royton House. So as I said, it had lots of different names. Um, but at this time, obviously, there's lots of change. This is down on, towards the south. So there's First World War starting. There's a lot of uh, moving and changing. And I had found some fascinating details from newspapers about the sale of her household go goods in the early, 19, early 1915. Um, but interestingly, the owner, there was a different owner, and I had details of him because he was living a couple of doors up the road, <laughs> as you do. Um, but interestingly, there was a sort of a gap. And But by 1915, interestingly, the house was being used, and I have to read this out to make sure I get it right. Um, it had been used by the Tunbridge Wells Women's Volunteer Reserve. Um, so, yeah, I found this really fascinating. So, obviously, again, first years of the First World War, but interestingly, the newspaper articles had all sorts of things about what they were doing. So there were things like training, instructional classes and training, uh, including semaphore signaling. Uh, there was meetings for the cycling call, uh, map reading, drill. And so, you know, so you imagine all these sort of ladies of, of independent means in the middle of Tunbridge Wells, 1915, and they want to do their bit for the First World War. Um, so I found that super fascinating that they were using the house in this way. Um, but then interesting, another newspaper article um, uh, advertised the fact that the, the Women's Volunteer Reserve were moving on to different premises because um, the house was required for military uh, purposes. Oh. 
So this was also interesting because I didn't, you know, know too much about this during the First World War. Um, and sadly, I didn't find out much more apart from the fact that it was acquired um, and the, the owner's records had the fact that Royton House um, from January 1916 was to be used for military authorities. So clearly some kind of base for, for military personnel um, in Tunbridge Wells. Um, so that was a whole picture of the life of this house during the First World War. Um, and interestingly, uh, again, newspapers show that there was a whole lot of changes, the 1920s. And all I had was uh, directories, which, um, and newspaper advertisements, I should say, um, that promoted the fact that by 1920, uh, Royton House had become a nursing home but not a nursing home in the way that we perhaps assume with just elderly people who've, who've gone to have care. But actually, this was effectively a type of hospital. But this is pre-NHS. This was a time when actually if you're looking for um, medical care, this was a private hospital, effectively. Um, so when all I had was that it was called the Royton House Nursing Hospital um, and that it had space for medical, surgical, chronic and maternity patients. Um, and actually the fees were four pounds and four shillings. Um, and it was run by matron Mrs. Shorter. So interestingly, 1921 census comes along. So instead of just not, I know, okay, it's the Royton House Nursing Home, but so now I have 1921 census and I have all the patients who were in the house on that night. So it's at this point, there were nine patients including four newborn babies, none of whom were named. They're literally in the census as just baby uh, under one month old. Um, so I can kind of perhaps decipher who the mums were, but not quite. Um, but along with some young women who were, were clearly the mums, but there were also um, some older gentlemen. There was a, uh, I'm just trying to read this, George Kirby, who was 72, from uh, New Cross, uh, uh, there was, and he was an independent gentleman, um, but then there was a whole list of others, and I, my eyesight's going, there was 60 year old, um, I'll get at this, oh yes, there was an out of work uh, gentleman, 60 years old, anyway, but it just totally brought to life this period of the house's history where there's all these patients there. Um, and as I say, there were nine different patients and four newborn babies. Um, so instead of just having, you know, nursing home 19, 20, 22, so now this whole period is brought to life where you've got all the different patients in, in the hospital on that night. Um, but again, with a lot of houses, I think this is actually quite a challenge with early 20th century, a lot of houses changed. There was a lot of change socially, um, but a lot of big houses like this is a prime example where it was literally a single family home, but it was just by the 1920s, it's either an institution like this, it's become a hospital or it starts getting divided into flats or the start, things start changing in that respect. Um, so it can be quite tricky with, with that early 20th century research. Um, but by 1939, it has been, uh, taken over by residents again and become different but it hadn't actually been divided into flats as such but um as far as i can understand it was divided into two spaces and the reason i'm uncertain is because the 1939 register still has redacted information for part yeah. of uh the house so it's not quite obvious and clear um i did have the names of some of the residents from electoral registers by this point um but it just shows you that things change and some you do often need a lot of different sources to piece it together not just quite often if you've got one there's there, there could be gaps and as i say with the 1939 register you still got redacted records where people are potentially um still within the data protection they're under 100 years old or those sorts of details um so it just it was a snapshot of like pre first world war all the way to pre second world war it it always astonishes me that that's such a short space of time like that's only 20 years but actually so much changed from you know an elderly woman living on her own with a family 
all the way through to a hospital um and then it becomes but it comes back to sort of shared accommodation um but that was so that was my example from tunbridge wells and there's there's a whole lot more that goes into that because it, yeah there was as you can imagine there's lots of changes and lots of people coming and going and that was another thing actually the 20s and 30s you got a lot of people coming and going and fewer people staying for extended periods so that's also fun and games to try and <laughs> work through all the different people but this is the thing like if we if we you know we've got our history of our house and the people who were resident there but if the house was used for something that wasn't just a residence if it was used yeah. Uh, as a military base as a hospital or as you will see in my example hopefully a boarding house yeah. um, there's even more people coming and going yes. and there's even more f fantastic people who at one point slept in that house and I just yeah. think that's really cool yeah yeah and I, I know I love hearing all that, that those stories about the changes I mean it can be kind of it, I want to say challenging, but slightly annoying sometimes, <laughs> you know, like if, if it changes that much, but actually, yeah, there's just all the more stories to discover. And actually there's, um, that's when you also start picturing perhaps how room layouts might've changed or, you know, perhaps, or, you know, was this, was this a surgery? Was this a bedroom? Was this, a, you know, like, and there's all those sorts of questions you can start to wonder about as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Right. Um, yeah. So I'll move on to my next question. I'm sorry. Next example, um, which is, uh, well, it's just an interesting one. And I chose it because um, it, you just you can basically research any kind of house. And the reason I'm saying that is because in 1949, this row of laborers cottages effectively burnt down. It was they were thatch. And basically the story, you know, the thatch caught fire and lit now the, the cottages are just shells and um, they're in the process of actually trying to reinstate them as as living accommodation and living quarters. Yeah. Um, but it meant that in that sort of early period of the, the 1900s, there were it, there was scope to find out more. And I think that's why certainly from the 1921 census, I was keen to sort of discover who was there. Um, and I knew that they were cottages literally in the middle of fields and across a creek and over the hill <laughs> there was a farm and I knew that actually from previous history they were owned by the farmer over the hill um, and so in the 1911 census there were these three families and they were all um, farm workers, labourers, um, cowmen, all working on the land in, in different forms um, but it's really interesting so it this just shows again that the context of finding more about who people were because a lot of these sorts of people um, might not be in directories or electoral registers again as i say so finding out 1911 one cottage was owned by or uh, lived in by charles wall who was 51 with his wife mary um, and son who was also a farm worker 15 years old and two daughters who were still at school um, and the 1911 census tells us they were living in five rooms um, so the rooms is is a vague description and actually it's there's debate about what was counted as a room and what wasn't but that doesn't that's certainly not five bedrooms that's five rooms within a structure so um, and more often than not the scullery or the the uh, the water closet it, probably, it wouldn't have been a water closet it would have been a um uh yeah a rough toilet out the back <laughs> so, yeah so next door you've got the green family so it's john green uh and his wife kate um they're also in their 50s um and along so they had three daughters and two sons um the sons were working on the land and working as farm laborers and the two youngest children were at school but the eldest daughters were working in needlework alongside their mother um so it they were recorded in seven rooms um but again it's giving the context of the fact that that's what uh seven people in seven rooms but that doesn't count you know the part you know the, the kitchen or the parlor or the um all the other rooms that go alongside that and then next door you had charles bobbitt and his wife elizabeth 
I know, isn't it a great name? Um, and their son, 14-year-old William Bobbitt, um, and they were living in three rooms. So again, it just shows you the slightly different variations about these, these cottages. Um, and then I knew from uh, other sort of records that um, the tax records, for example, the 1910 valuation, um, they weren't recorded individually. It was basically because the cottages were part of the larger farm, it was just included as cottages on the farm. So I didn't know anything from that. Um, but I did know later the details of the men certainly come up in the electoral registers and things like that. Um, but the 1921 census was great because it gave more context. Um, and we know Charles Bobbitt is still there with his wife, Elizabeth. Um, and But by this point, their granddaughter, Mary Drake, is there. Um, and again, this is key because I wouldn't have known anything about the granddaughter from any of the other records. So that's a key point um, in just highlighting the sort of social history you can find. Um, and that could lead you on. I mean, I, in this context, I haven't gone further, but you could then look up back at the children of the Bobbits and work out who who married and who's married to, and whose granddaughter it is. Um, and then the Greens were still there. John Green was still there in his... Um, and interesting, I was just going to point out, the Bobbitts were still recorded as three rooms, but the Greens, who were recorded as seven rooms in 1911, are recorded as four rooms in 1921. So that's, again, I think taking away that um, differentiation, by 1921, they're clearly more defined about what rooms are counted. Um, but John Green's there with his wife, Kate, still working on the land um, and still... Uh, with their children, who were in their 20s by this point, um, and there were five of them in the house. And then on top of that, there were new, the wards had moved on, the W-A-R-R, sorry, <laughs> not the war. Um, not the war. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so there's new uh, residents, George Mounty and his family. They were only in their 20s, so he was 26. His wife, Gertrude, was 25. Um, and then uh, son, gosh, yeah. Although sadly, the children are only recorded with initials. So this is where you get another challenge with trying to work out with different records again, going back or forward into different records, who, what, who they were and what their names were, looking at perhaps birth dates and um, registers of birth and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it, the key point was it just brought to life again this whole um, context of this little row of cottages literally in the middle of a field in Somerset. Um, and it brings to life the working lives, the people who are working there, the, the women who are doing needlework at home with their daughters, that sort of thing. Um, and it just it just brings it to more to life when you've got those details. As is, And again, because they wouldn't have come up in the, certainly the women um, wouldn't have come up on the electoral registers. Uh, and then by 1939, um, it's a whole different group of people. Um, and again, I knew from other records during the uh, 30s, I've got a bit more information from newspapers and directories and things about some of the people coming and going um, and the tax records. Um, and so by 1939, there's still labourers' cottages and they're still um, shared by working people working the land. Um, but again, there are large portions that are redacted. So I don't know if you can even see, <laughs> see yeah. that. That's my printout. Um, so still three cottages, but yeah, there's there's different families and and um, different circumstances. But it's it's more than likely again that they're probably children. So that's why they're redacted. Um, but yeah, it just it, it was just that whole picture of different types of houses from a tiny little workers' cottage in the middle of fields through to sort of a much grander house on. A, a popular, highly sought after address in Tunbridge Wells and the different kind of households, the different people you find, their different stories. And then you can go off from there. You can actually look further into parish registers or, or civil registration, newspapers. And it, it was from the newspapers that we knew the houses burnt down in this context of the cottages because they're burnt down now. <laughs> but actually, the owners knew that information. Um, but obviously in the newspapers, I've got 1949, I've got the stories of what happened when the when the cottage was burnt down, the fact that they managed to, no one died, but they the fire swept through very quickly and almost all the people lost um, most of their belongings because it just went through. And it's all in the newspaper stories about what happened and other people 
um, racing to come and help, but it was too late. And so again, this whole sort of life of stories you can find in houses. And if you delve a bit further, this is kind of, as you said at the beginning, this gives you sort of a skeleton to work through and you've got people's names and their date, birth dates and things. But then you can delve further and work out who they were and what their stories were and how long did they work on on the farm in in that part of Somerset or did they move on somewhere else? What happened after the war? Those sorts of things. You know, it's fascinating. You could absolutely just because this, this I don't know if you're anything like me, uh, Melanie, but I could fall down rabbit holes. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I I you know you do you're doing a little bit of house history and you, you you've got you've got your main things that you need really, but then you start wondering, oh, I wonder what happened to this person. Yes. I wonder what they did then. I wonder what they did then. And then suddenly, you know, it's two in the morning and you haven't yeah. eaten dinner. Yeah. I'll just do a quick search. What happened to them? Where were they? You know. <laughs> yeah. I think many many of our lovely yeah. community are watching now can uh, can attest to that. Yes. Also. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, do you mind if I share my wee example? No, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd hope there would be time. So good that Yay! we've got time. So great. <laughs> I actually pulled a couple of slides for this as well. So I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, so the example I wanted to look at was um, the house that was once owned by my grandparents. It's where my mum grew up and it's where I spent many, many happy memories as a child. And this is this is the um, the house I would have talked about last week, the house I looked at first in, 20, in the 21 census. Um, but sadly, you know, they, well, not sadly, all my panelists last week had fantastic stories to share. So yeah. that's fine. Um, <laughs> and I think this is a great case study in just start with what you know, don't try and get really het up about what you don't know yet. Um, you know, I, I did start with what I did know, and I made a little list, you know, the fact that it was, um, it was it's in Melodon, it's called Tan Plan. It's actually, um, it's due to be sold soon, I think, uh, finally. Mm. Um, I was always told that it was around 100 years old. Um, my grandparents, I think, moved in sometime in the 60s. And I know that my great, great aunt married somebody who lived nearby in the nearby Mellod farm. So that was always really good to know. And her hubby had a really bizarre middle name Yardley which was was really key and I also know that it used to be a one-story thatched building and I do actually have a photograph huh. of that um at some point that was knocked down and then that was replaced with the house that you saw just a moment ago and the little map there that's I believe that's a snippet from the um the deeds that my mum sent me um that's the only thing she sent me Thanks, Mum. Oh. I need the rest of it, please. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I've got so far. Um, and just for context as well, in terms of where we're looking. So Melodon is a small village in North Wales. It's a, an old mining community. Uh, the mine was shut down in, I think, 1884. And it's uh, just down that little hill where we can see the plot of land just there as well. Um, so I had a very, very quick look at early census records. And... Um, I don't, I think it is there pre-1881, but it's not clearly marked, as we've already said, you know, sometimes it's really difficult to find that house that's the one you're after because it's not clearly marked with its name or it's got a different name or, yeah. Yeah. Frustrating. Um, <laughs> but this is it in the 1881 census and you've got a chap called Robert living there with his family and he's a lead miner. And then you've got 1891. Um, now, interestingly, it was called Tantlan in... 1881 but by the time you get to 1891 it's down as Tan Uthlan. Um, a very a important lesson in being really bored with your search. Um, um, yeah same family living there but interestingly Robert is now a farm labourer not a miner because as we've already said the, the mine closed down. Um, the 1901 census here, and I found this a little bit more easily by actually searching for the chap with the, the odd middle name, and then I opened up the original images and I scrolled through to find the right one, and again it's listed as Tan Earthlam. I have yet to find it in the 1911 census, this ah. part, because every, I've been scrolling through all the images and I can see, because it's, it's on a road called Forth Pen Rilfa. I've probably mispronounced that. Sorry, Grandma. Um, it's often misspelt. Um, but when I've been looking at all of the images, it's 
the houses aren't named like I can definitely mm. spot the vicarage I can spot the post office I can spot the pub up the road I can spot the schoolhouse but none of the houses are actually named which is really frustrating mm. um so yeah and then when I actually went to look in the um the 1921 census I I didn't find it by using the address search and I think this is really important um these are some really important fields to use. Um, if you don't, if you don't have any success with the address search, go into the advanced search for the census record in question and use the parish field and the op yeah. optional keyword field, which you can use with wildcards. These are really, really handy. But again, I found the house in 1921 by using um, the chap Harold Yardley Williams again. That really, mm. really helped. Information is not always recorded how you would expect, basically. <laughs> Um, it tells me that the house has five rooms, which is really cool. And also never forget, uh, if you're looking on 21, to go to the next page on the right, look at the little silver arrow, and you can see the address there. Um, at this point, we've got um, a lady called Elizabeth Barnes living there, and she was from Abadovi or Abadovi. Um, and there are a lot of visitors, actually, mm. a lot of visitors, and a lot of them are from Yorkshire. And I found out that actually by uh, looking ahead to the 1939 register that she was living with her hubby, um, Richard Edward Barnes, and he is now listed as a boarding housekeeper. Um, and mm. what's quite cool about this house is that my great grandma used to live in the flat that's actually next door. So they, it's, it's one building, but it's two properties and it's connected by a door at the top of the staircase. So it was once used as a boarding house, which is really, really fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, Richard isn't there in 1921. He's actually um, uh, it, back in Liverpool. He, had, he was a grocer. He lived, uh, lived and worked at 68 Granbury Street and he had an adopted son, which was really cool. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I found this hmm. fascinating. Back in 1911, the adopted son was actually listed as a nephew. Ooh, interesting. Um, and then by 1939, um, the adopted son, Huell, is actually married... And there's a little note next to his wife, Hannah's name. It says London Gazette. And I believe, I can't quite see this now. Um, the date that's listed there is the 12th of the 9th, 1944. So I knew that there was a mention in the London Gazette. And that could tell me why her name, Evans, is crossed out with Saxton in 1944. And I found it. She actually yeah. changed her name from Saxton, excuse me, from Evans to Saxton. And then a couple of days later, this additional one um, that's, it says they're still married. Doesn't say anything mm. about divorce, but for some reason she changed her name. Interesting. I learned that Elizabeth, going into the parish records, I learned that Elizabeth's father was a master mariner, which then helped me find um, more of them in the census records. Like so, mm. I found an obituary. Excuse me, that's cut off a little bit. That's frustrating. Um, I found an obituary for Richard's death. It gave me loads more information, and it tells me that Hull was serving in um, Holland in 1945 when he died. And quite, quite poignantly, actually, he's buried in the same churchyard as my grandfather. Mm which I, I never thought to think that. I never thought to think yeah. that there are people who lived in this house who would have lived and died there who would literally be buried up the road in the churchyard. Yeah, yeah. I never, never stopped to think about that. Mm. And then I've, I just, uh, just to round it off, a couple of um, newspaper articles as well. Um, so this is from 1915. And we can see the address of 68 Granbury Street. So we know by this point, by 1915, that the Barneses have got it. Um, but skipping ahead to after uh, Richard died, it seemed to fall into the hands of a chap called Mason, and then he was letting it out. And that's that. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I was think that clearly cool. shows all the different sources as well. Like you, you use so many different ones, which is great. So, yeah. I love doing this. <laughs> I, could do, I could do it all day. I could do research all day. Um, yeah. And I know you've already touched upon, and we've both already touched upon, how you can get around certain challenges. But I just wondered if there are any more tips that you'd like to share. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it has to be said. I mean, you think, I think a lot of people think, and I was kind of guilty of this myself with the 1921 census, I thought the addresses would be easier to find, but um, that's not the case. <laughs> so, um, and it's more often than not because they just weren't recorded. And I've had this conversation with a few people where they kind of assume that the full street addresses are what we know now, but actually it, it doesn't seem that long ago, but you know, that 
during the 1920s, a lot of houses were still just known by, you know, Mrs. Smith who lives down the hill or whatever it is. Uh, but in terms of a sort of official postal addresses, we it was only in the 60s that we started to get more um, official post um, postcodes and more sort of formalization of post addresses. So, so yeah, searching through some of these records, let alone if it's illegible or it's difficult to read or actually if it's in a different language or, you know, like there's all sorts of challenges. Um, and I think one of the, the Tudor house I was talking about, it's, it's had so many, I think I've counted seven different name, spellings of the same name. It's got a really quite unusual name, so it's kind of understandable. But in all the records, whether I'm searching for deeds or whether I'm, you know, catalogs, trying to, you've almost got to put in all different seven variations. <laughs> like, um, and, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have a street address at all. Even now it doesn't have a street address. It's just the name of the house and the village it's in. So searching these things, uh, I think I found, certainly with the 1921 census, um, what you said earlier with, with the parish, uh, that's definitely the easiest. But I, it has to be said, I knew the names of the people I was looking for in a lot of contexts. So, so the problem with that is because that the address might not be clearly identified, you can find the parish and you can identify where you are. But if you're trying to find who was in the house, but the house is not identified, you kind of need a name or a few names from other sources that will help you try and piece that together. Um, with a lot of these, um, I looked at a few different examples and I, I was actually at the National Archives trawling through page after page. So I wasn't paying for every single view. Um, so like we do actually with earlier census returns, so whether it's 1911 all the way back to 1841, quite often with addresses you do have to search pages and you end up kind of almost researching the entire village or at least an entire street yeah. to try and work out okay the the smiths were there then and then the joneses were there and then okay two doors down is the pub so that means you know like all that you kind of have to turn detective and do that and it was the same with the 21 census um we're trying to follow names of people and details that you have from other sources so um, but that parish search was probably the easiest I found because this the address search didn't really work for most of the houses I was looking at. Um, so yeah, it's it's that makes it a bit more of a challenge. But um, I would say again, it yeah, it is very much looking at different sources. So if you've got rate books and perhaps a mention in the in the electoral registers, and then you can match that with perhaps 1911. And then you can search different things, um, perhaps even war records or things like that, where it might reference the, the address of a, of a soldier or things like that. Um, so it is a case of sort of, uh, yeah, turning detective and piecing together bits, different bits of information. Um, but yeah, it was it has been a challenge. Um, and there's one house I'm actually in the middle of researching now in Kent, which I mentioned at the beginning. And I still I haven't found them in the 1921 census. And that's possibly because no one was there. But yeah. interestingly, in the 1911 census, uh, it's not it's not there. But I found the house because I could look at the summary records. And the summary by the enumerator actually recorded several houses that were not occupied, but they were listed. So I, And so much so that actually it had the name of um, the owner who I knew from rate books, um, but it then had a note saying building. And then in the 1910 valuation, I could look and actually in the field book records, again, I've got the name of the owner who's living in a house a few doors away. Um, but in the description of the house, it actually says um, recently pulled down, new house being built. So more clues about you know if you match 1911 you've got the 1910 valuation which was taken between 1910 and 1915 um and then the fact that there are gaps in the records it's annoying but at the same time you can see that actually there was a great amount of change like the an old house was being knocked down a new one's being built meanwhile the first world wars are roaring on so perhaps things were delayed someone didn't move into a few you know all those kinds of things um so it it's yeah being a bit of a Colombo piecing together bits of information. <laughs> I think this is the thing, though, and I think the same can be said for family history as well. You look at one record, yeah, you'll you'll get a couple of clues from it, but it's not it's not going to be it's not going to give you any definitive details, any yeah. definitive answers. 
But if you take that, imagine if it's a puzzle piece, you put it, you put it down, and then you go into another record, and you go, oh, another puzzle piece. Yeah. And another one. And sooner or later, those puzzle pieces uncover the wider picture. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, just check all your sources basically because this <laughs> as is you know as we can see from b- both of our examples is mm. um, one tends to find another if that makes sense there's, yes there's sort yeah. of a natural progression yeah um, it just un- it, sometimes you can unlock more questions rather than yeah. answers but um <laughs> it's still progress i find yes yeah definitely. um let's see if we can squeeze in a couple of questions um let me have a scroll up here see if i can pull any out got some great comments in as well which is great nice um yes uh loma saying thank you for clarifying about the rooms i had an ancestor living in bradford with their four children and only two rooms and now i understand that's not bedrooms what a tough life absolutely Mm, yeah Absolutely. Um, okay, question from Cheryl. Um, how can I find out who lived in a house in the 50s and 60s? I only have the address, no names, but I know that the owner committed suicide there. Ooh. I've looked in the newspapers many times, but I've not found anything. Ooh. Any um, well, I, well, there's a few things. I would probably straight away think of the electoral registers for that period, because you sh- should find most people eligible to vote uh, recorded in the electoral registers. Um, you might need to go to your nearby record office to view those, depends on where you are and their availability online. Um, the other thing I would probably just check about newspapers is just where you're looking and what newspapers are actually digitised and available online, because you might find that um, in your region, there's perhaps a few key newspapers that haven't been digitised yet or something like that, where that's why you're not finding anything. Um, So the other option is there is an alternative newspaper search, which is available through Gale newspapers, um, just as a a different (laughs) from the British newspaper archive, but they are the Times, the Sunday Times, the, the Guardian, uh, they're national newspapers, so you might not, again, you might not find that particular story, but it's another option if you're looking at newspapers. Um, and again, your local archives, it's its a shape, trying to search newspapers in local archives, it's proper old school, you've got microfilm and you have to spend hours searching. But if you knew, if, if you know when the event took place, then you can at least perhaps if you've got a bit of time one morning, you can go to the newspapers in the archives and look at the newspapers of that around that date and you might find more that way. But but yeah, certainly who lived in your house, I would go electoral registers first, then uh, then trade directories um, and then rate books and, and parish um, tax records, things like that. You can find more. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I've um, got a question from Rita here. Have you ever done research, house research in the United States? And if yes, what records would you recommend to get me started? Sadly, I haven't. Um, I I haven't. A lot of people ask this about the US, Australia and uh, Europe, actually. There's a lot of um, call for for branching out. Um, But sadly, I haven't. So I do know, I mean, there's a number of American records um, online through the different sites um, and they've got their own census records and things like that. They've got different availability Um, there. You could, well, yeah, there's a whole a whole branch. There are a lot of house historians in America. They tend to be state focused. Um, so depending on where you're looking and where the house is situated, you could do a few searches online, get some advice from someone that way. Um, that that'd probably be my my best suggestion. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm scrolling up here and I'm just going to Oh, this was a good one from Sally. I don't have the deeds to my house. It was built in 16 something. How do I find the deeds? Who might have them? Well, uh, sadly, in a lot of cases, no, people don't have deeds and they've they've long been thrown out or disappeared through solicitors going bust or where, however it happened. Having said that, um, you, can have, you can, of course, get in touch with land registry, but they tend to have the most recent information because it's a, the legal requirement for land registry rather than historic. Um, they might have a few clues, at least. 
Um, but probably the best thing to do is look at the local record office for where you're situated because they could be in the record office within a collection held there. So that could be an old manor, could be part of an estate, it could be part of a, a former solicitor's collection. Um, there's all sorts of things tucked away in our local record offices and archives. And actually, I'm I'm still, every time I go, I'm still surprised about what they have. And sometimes you do have to go there because there's been many occasions where I've actually found deeds and records that have big pieces of the pu puzzle for a house history, but they're not catalogued. You know, a lot of our archives, they've got boxes and boxes that they know roughly what's there, but they don't know the individual documents within each box. So things like that, you often have to go there and actually look at a physical box and go through things. Um, but that would be the best. I You may find some some records. If it was part of Old Manor, there's all sorts of other options. So you might not have the deeds, but you might have manorial records like court books or old lease uh, or um, old leases or rent um, information that was kept by the manor. And they've still got information that will help with piece together the story of your house but if it, it was built in 16 something it's going to take a bit of a bit of time to to work through and i often i would work backwards as well so you might be really tempted to just sort of jump into 1650 and go who was there what was going on but actually you often have to go from more recent history and work backwards and you end up tracing a house by people rather than uh, rather than address as we've been saying even in the 20th century, addresses aren't clearly recorded. So you can imagine in 1650, often records are just the house or Smith's farm or whatever, you know, and unless you know it was Smith who was there, then actually you, you don't know what house you're looking at. So it's, um, yeah, a bit of a process, but you'll get there. Just head to the archives. That's the best thing. That's solid advice. Well, I think that's bring, brought us up to the top of the hour, actually. Um, no. Really, really fascinating discussion, uh, Melanie. Thank you so much for agreeing to come back and chat to me about his house history again. You know, it's always a pleasure and this, the yeah. hours always go far too quickly. Yeah, um, yeah it's, been, it's been lovely. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for asking me. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's great. And to our lovely community, thank you so much for your fantastic comments and questions as usual. Apologies if we did not get to your question. Um, Niall has been in the comments and sharing some links to some blogs that Melanie has kindly written for us. Um, wow. There's loads of great advice in those. So those are a great first port of call, actually. And on Friday, be sure to come back for Friday's Live because uh, Miko's hosting this week. Mm -hmm. And we've got lots more coming up on the schedule over the, following, the coming weeks as well. So yes, thank you so much. We will leave it there. Um, thanks again to Melanie and take care of yourselves, everybody. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.